Anupredi is something that we decided that probably it's better we do it in detail because when we just browse through during the basic courses, there were so many questions, especially from our trainees, the registrars, and probably from other specialists who wanted to understand a little bit more because it, it, it is a little bit gray area in our region here because it's not being routinely offered most in most government settings. But um, I thought it is important that we cover it the way it should be covered. So it may be a little bit heavy as the cause for some, but uh, I want to assure you that I've tried to simplify the best I can uh, to make it underst uh, understood. So if we start uh, with the Down syndrome story, in 1866, Langton Lung Downs, uh, John Langton Downs noted that the way these babies were being born, but these babies had very funny faces and they had a skin that looked like it was too big for their body. This is what Langdon Downs noted. And he also noted that this baby had some neuro, um, uh, mental handicap, neuro, uh, um, uh, some neurological and some mental handicap of some sort uh, along the way. So uh, that was in 1866. But it took a very long time for the world to realize that um, there was need to screen for Downs. But Langdon Downs, Downs had already noted that there were these kind of babies uh, who were being born. Uh, because in countries like England, uh, public health system or all the health system is publicly funded by the government. They noted that uh, women were giving birth to babies with Down syndrome. And unfortunately for the Down syndrome people, they will never live home. They will never probably become independent because of the uh, physical and the mental handicap they have. As a result, they became a, more of a social uh, economic burden for the, uh, for the country uh, of England. So they decided that it was better to start screening pregnant women uh, to identify those who are likely to have babies Down syndrome um, and then offer them probably the option of a termination of pregnancy so that Down syndrome babies, if possible, they are not born. Uh, this was not forced on the people. Of course, it's an option that people would be given. Then in 1970s, they introduced the maternal age as a screening tool to say women who are above 35 years, they should all be offered a diagnostic test. A diagnostic test means doing an, putting a needle in somebody, inside someone's uh, belly and taking the fluid which around the baby or taking the placenta tissue, which is chorionic villa assembling, and send it to the laboratory to see whether Down syndrome is there or not. So this was the maternal age in the 1970s. But what disappointed in those 1970s is that uh, still Down syndrome babies continue to be born uh, in women who are below the age of 35. So this therefore means that the age of 35 on its own was going to exclude certain women or, uh, with Down syndrome who are below the age of 35. So people moved on to do more research and they came up with serum alpha fetoprotein as one of the markers for Down syndrome. Again, this test was probably picking about six out of the 100 Down syndrome babies and it was not good enough. So people continued to research and the triple test came again in the 80s. Uh, the triple test was now doing more markers than just the serum alpha fetoprotein. Um, these are second trimester markers, by the way. These are second trimester markers. That, that, is, that means they were being done after 14 weeks of gestation. So uh, the triple test, which would include uh, human coronic gonadotrophin, alpha fetoprotein, and either uh, inhibin A um, or estri uh, uh, unconjugated estriol uh, to make it quadruple test. So this test could need to be offered. But again, the detection rate was less and less. Uh, than what was expected, and Down syndrome babies continue to be missed. Then in the 90s, then came the neurodegeneracy uh, by Professor Kipros Nicolaides, um, who noted that babies with Down syndrome, they actually had increased fluid behind the baby's neck uh, when you scan them between 11 to 14 weeks. But the challenge that was happening then is that women were not coming to present to their gynecologist before their 14 weeks, most of them would come after 16 weeks. So this is a method that was being challenged by the fact that women were not presenting early. 
which I believe in most of our regions we, we are today, we still have this challenge where women do not come early enough to be offered screening tests. So, um, so having discovered that still the NUCA translucence on its own was picking about 65%, 65 babies out of 100, which is about 65%, and it was not good enough. So then came the combined test. I'll describe all this. Then came the combined test uh, in the 2000s, where you would um, mix both the maternal age, the, uh, the NUCA translucency, and the first trimester biochemical markers, first trimester biochemical markers, which I'll mention. This is called the combined test. And this test is still present even today. This is the test which is being done in most parts of the world as we speak. Um, then in the 2010s, then came the fetal cell-free DNA test, which is the test of our times, which is the most uh, sensitive test with a, a very high detection rate, which probably in the future will become the test for doing Down syndrome screening. However, at the moment is being limited by the cost that very few women will afford to have it where the screening is not funded by the national health system. So Professor Kipros done a lot of work in Down syndrome and probably has revolutionized the screening for Down syndrome. And most of the Down syndrome that is happening throughout the world is a, as a result of his amazing work in Down syndrome screening, as you will see uh, in, during my presentation. Then if we were to just compare these methods which I've mentioned, uh, these are the detection rates which I've already mentioned that, um, but before I go there, let me just emphasize a point here that um, actually you may find that, especially in our region down here, there are people who are still screening women based in, uh, on maternal age alone. They will send a woman for Down syndrome because she's about 35 years. What it simply means is that you are still practicing in the 1970s. That means you are going to miss uh, most of your patients who actually have babies Down syndrome because they're under the age of 35. Because more than 50% of Down syndrome babies are born by women who are below the age of 35. So if you are still stuck in the 1970s, you are not doing a lot of service to, you, to the women you are looking after because Down syndrome babies are found also in women who are below the age of 35. Then, uh, most, because most of our women are not presenting early enough before 14 weeks, you may find that most uh, practitioners may still be offering the triple and the quadruple test, which are not the best tests to offer, but we need to change this because this is not good enough. Then there are some who are still just sending the woman for an NT scan, just go and have your NT. If the NT is reported by the sonographer as normal, they tell the woman that we have screened you for Down syndrome. I want to tell you that this is in the 90s. We are still practicing in the 90s, and we all need to move with our times. We need to migrate and either offer the women combined tests or a fit or self DNA test, because this is the practice of the 90s before more better methods were, were discovered. Then when it comes to the, uh, to just show you, this is just a table to compare all these methods. Uh, you can see that the NUCA test, if you just do the NUCA translucent and you stop there, you don't do anything, you are more likely to miss uh, between the, uh, close to 40, between 30 and 40 percent of your baby's Down syndrome. Uh, if you use the maternal age and you do uh, PAPA and BTCG uh, in first trimester, that is, this is first trimester, and this is first trimester as well, you are going to miss 40 percent of baby's Down syndrome, but the tissue rate is about 60 percent. Then if you do the combined test, that means you miss about 15%, which is probably um, better than these two above. So this is the combined test, which is done probably in most uh, countries in our uh, region here. And in most parts of Europe and England, is still doing this kind of a test for most of its pregnant women. Then if we do add additional markers as recommended by Fetal Medicine Foundation, I will describe these markers in my presentation. That is the nasal bone, ductus venosa doppler, and tricus regurgitation. We are going to improve the detection rate to 92%. That means we only miss 8% of babies with Down syndrome. If we do the triple test, which I said, unfortunately, most of the women in our region present in second trimester, that means we will miss about 30%. 
or babies with Down syndrome, because the detection rate is just 69%. Then if we do the quadruple test, that is 81% with the quadruple test, we better say about 19%. Then if we offer the fetal self DNA test, which is either called NIPT, sometimes times it's called the harmony, depending on the trading company, our triple screen, they have various names used for the fetal self DNA test. We are only going to miss eight out of a thousand babies with Down syndrome. So this is the best test to offer. The only limitation that is currently beyond the reach of many. So if we were to offer a test, we are saying these are the tests which are better to offer we can offer them fetal cell free DNA tests or a combined test with additional markers. If we can't do this one, at least let's do this one, which gives us a detection rate of 85%. That is the combined test without additional markers. Uh, then why were women coming after 16 weeks? It is because uh, when England decided, England was always the leader, uh, in terms of <laughs> antenatal care in those times. So England decided after some protests from women's groups that they wanted to offer their women antenatal care. But to manage the health system, the health minister of that, those days, Arthur Greenwood, uh, promulgated that a women should start presenting for antenatal care at 16 weeks without any rationale or uh, any evidence to say why should they present at 16 weeks. So women started to come for the very first time to be seen at 16 weeks. This is why when the screening started, people started to screen women in second trimester because there was no one who was coming before 16 weeks. And most of our regions or our countries were still stuck to this. Most of our women do not present to us until they are 16 weeks. But we are saying they are following a 1929 protocol which has since been changed even by the very country which introduced it. So Professor Kipros Nikolaidis, in the 90s and 2000s, he started uh, presenting on the turning of the pyramid of care because he had discovered that it was possible to start screening for pregnancy complications as early as 12 weeks by doing an ultrasound scan and measuring the fluid behind the baby's neck. So what does this mean? That means instead of women coming for the very first time in 16 weeks, Women should now come to, for their very first anatomy care at least minimum 12 weeks or even earlier so that their pregnancy can be accurately dated and they come at the right time at the 12 weeks come. So this was what uh, Professor Nicolaidis uh, uh, he argued to say, look, it is possible that all women, instead of them uh, coming at 16 weeks, they should come at 12 weeks so that they can be offered screening for Down syndrome. But now we are aware that it's not just Down syndrome that can be offered there. We can screen them for preeclampsia as well. We can screen them for preterm birth and all the other things at 12 weeks. As I'm speaking, most women in England now present at 12 weeks for the screening for Downs. So some may argue and say, our women in our region will never present at 12 weeks. But I want you to be aware that it is a mindset because even when Professor Kipros uh, Nicolette started uh, the idea of women coming at uh, 12 weeks, people were arguing with him that no one will come at 12 weeks. But as we are speaking in most of the progressive world, women actually present at 12 weeks to have their pregnancy looked at, dated, and offered screening for annual AD. Then, then before we go deep into the uh, Down syndrome screening, when women come at uh, 12 weeks, it is not only the measuring of nuchal which is important. Because I've seen that most, in most cases when women go to the sonographers or the graphers, all they do is to measure the CRL and then they go on to measure the uh, nuchal translucent and the scan is complete. But I want us to be aware that it is beyond, we have to do the scan beyond just doing the nuchal translucency and the, uh, and the uh, CRL. I'll explain why it is important to do that. So what is the scanning protocol? Of course, the scanning protocol, the most important thing after checking the viability and the number of features that are obtaining, we need to do a proper CRL. A proper CRL that is crown ramp length, which is measured um, with the baby in strict surgical position, where we see the tip of the nose and also the genital tubercle seen, which is the feature gender. 
and the calipers for doing the CRL should be put on the ramp and also on the crown, and we should make sure that the, um, the baby is horizontal and uh, there is fluid between the chin and the chest. And if we were to draw a line here, the line should either be a straight line or should form an angle of, 30, of about 15 to 30 degrees to make sure that we are not over flexing or we are not extended at the level of the neck. So this is how a CRL should be done. And for us to offer screening for aneuploidy in the first trimester, the crown ramp length should measure between 45 and 84 millimeters to offer screening for aneuploidy in first trimester. Then in terms of the nuchal translucency, the nuchal translucency, because the nuchal translucency is always conveyed to the CRL, this therefore means that you cannot do the, the nuchal translucency without doing the CRL. So the CRL should be done appropriately and properly. If you underestimate the CRL or overestimate it, it will affect the interpretation of the nuchal translucency. Then the nuchal translucency from the same image of the CRL, well, all we need is to apply some nobology on the image and we'll be left with the baby's thorax and that just the baby's head and the thorax, then we we reduce the gain or the grayscale until the image is dark enough to remove the fuzziness that we sometimes see around the nuchal space. When the nuchal space is as clear as it is, and the amnion should always be visualized to make sure that you are not measuring the amnion. In this case, this fetus amnion is here because before 15 weeks, the amnion is not yet fused to the chorion. So we should see the amnion as we see there. Then when we measure, we should make sure that the caliper is seated on to on. You are not measuring within the thickness of the nuca uh, or the thickness of the baby's uh, snake skin there. So it should be on to on and it should be perpendicular as demonstrated on that image there. And we should measure the thickest part of the nuca. So we should make sure that our baby is strictly sagittal, seeing the tip of the nose and you are not seeing the zygoma the zygoma is this bone which comes out if you are oblique here. This is the maxilla and the mandible. So this is how we should see the baby's head and also the thorax and the skin of the back of the fetus continuous like this. If there is a cord, an umbilical cord around, then you have to measure above and below the cord, then you calculate the average of the two. So this is how the nuchal translucent should be done. Uh, for us to make sure that we have done it properly. These are the, the most important images uh, when you are scanning the level to technique uh, babies. Then we need to assess the nasal bone. To assess the nasal bone, during, on the same image we check the nuchal translucency, we just need to make sure that the beam of the ultrasound scan is perpendicular to the baby's nose. Then we lower the grayscale as we did here. You can see we've lowered the grayscale, we've made the image dark, we've adjusted the dynamic range on the machine, and where we are now, we can see that there is a nasal bone below the baby's skin. The tip of the nose is the baby's skin, and the skin above here, again, um, is the skin is on the nasal bone. The nasal bone is this white part, which is marked by a small one there. This is another baby where we could not outline the nasal bone. If you just look and say if the nasal bone is there or not, it may look like it's there, but if you compare these two images, you can see that we don't see the second line below the baby's skin. So this is a baby who had a hypoplastic nasal bone in first trimester where the nasal bone was not identified in first trimester. It does not mean that the nasal bone will be absent in second trimester. Then the doctor's venosa should also be measured properly. We've read, uh, probably discussed this, that whenever we are measuring the, uh, the doctor's venosa, we should try to elevate the baby's back to make sure that our angle uh, is aligning to the vessel. Uh, the, 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 the pulse wave gate is parallel to the vessel and we measure the, uh, the, the, the doctor's venosa looking for the A wave. So this was a normal doctor's venosa where the A wave was present. This is systolic wave, diastolic wave, and the A wave here. This is one of our images where the doctor's venosa was actually reversed. So these are the secondary markers that we talk of, absent nasal bone, reversed doctor's venosa. And this is the trachus regurgitation, whereby if you are doing trachus regurgitation, we want to 
put the baby's heart in the four chamber view. Then you go to the tricuspid valve. The tricuspid valve is the one on the right side of the heart. So we go on the tricuspid valve there. Then we put our, our, our pulse wave gate. We should get three millimeters, the pulse wave gate. When we put, put the pulse wave gate, you should make sure that a third of the pulse wave gate is in the atrium, while a two thirds in, is in the ventricle. Then we assemble and we get a tracing like the one we see there. So in this case, we'll be saying this is a normal tricuspid um, pulse wave Doppler because we do not see a negative waveform which represents regurgitation. The next image will show you the regurgitation jet where there is a negative flow here, which is more than 60 centimeters per second, showing that there is indeed tricuspid regurgitation at the level of the tricuspid valve on this baby here. So this is how we assess the secondary aneuploid markers. Then we go on to assess the anatomy. There is a certain anatomy which you should assess because it has got a significant meaning when it comes to the risk estimation. The orbits should be seen, as we can see there, that there are two orbits. This is how we rule out cyclopia. Cyclopia means they will just be in one eye or hypotelorism. We see this condition in holoprosencephaly. Holoprosencephaly is a first trimester diagnosis. Aloba holoprosencephaly is a first trimester diagnosis, not a second or third trimester diagnosis. So this is why we need these kind of images so that we don't miss a condition such as holoprosencephaly. We should always be diagnosed in first trimester. Um, then, we, then we check also the palate uh, and we also check the retronasal triangle here. Um, the retinas are trying with the palate. This is the alveolar ridge where the teeth will develop. That the palate to check for big cleft palates in first trimester. The same applies to the uh, retinas uh, triangle where we, we see the maxilla and also the, the, uh, the, the side bones there. That's the retinas are trying, which you also use to screen for big cleft palates. Small cleft palates will be dif difficult to detect in first trimester. Then when you go to the heart, we also want to check the heart to make sure that there is filling that is happening to the two ventricles. We can see the filling of the heart there. Then we should also check the situs by making sure that the stomach is to the left as well as the heart point to the left. After identifying the baby's left shoulder, uh, that's how we come up with situs. Then we check what we call the three vessel trachea view, where we show that there is a, a pulmonary trunk continuing as the ductus arteriosus and being met together with the aortic arch and the isthmus here. This is how we assess the great vessels um, or the outflow tracks in the first trimester by checking what you call the three vessel tracker view using color Doppler this way. This will allow us to rule out for major defects such as hypoplastic left heart or to suspect defects such as transposition of great vessels or tetralogy of alone. Then we also need to check at the level of the bladder to make sure that uh, there are two vessels which surround the fetal bladder like this, uh, so that we rule out uh, single umbilical artery, uh, which signifies that there may be underlying chromosome abnormalities or other defects of the kidneys or the heart. So we do this image to demonstrate the three vessel um, uh, cord. Then we also do this image where we measure the bladder when the baby is in surgical view. We measure the bladder length because we want to screen for megacystis or a big bladder, which is also a marker for aneuploidy chromosome abnormalities. Then we check the cord insertion. The importance of checking the cord insertion, we are um, confirming the intactness of the anterior abdominal wall. Anterior abdominal wall, such as exomphalos or omphalos, greatly changes the risk of a baby um, in terms of chromosome abnormality screening. So we need this image in first trimester, which shows these three lines where the umbilical cord is joining the baby on its tummy there. It's a very, very important image to demonstrate because we have ruled out one of the bad, bad malformations such as exomphalos or in, in very sad situations, um, uh, body stock anomalies or pentalogy of cantrell. Then we go on to assist the posterior fossa of the baby. 
at the posterior force of the baby, we want to look when the baby is in stage to apply the same image we use to check the nuclear translucency after reducing the gray scale and making the image darker. We check at the back where we measure what you call the brain stem, because this is the part of the brain stem we see there, which continues into the spinal cord. So this is the brain stem component. And um, just below, behind it, we have the fourth ventricle and the cystina magna space. This space, these lines you say, the dark space, this is the cystina magna, this is the fourth ventricle, and this is the brain stem. Yeah. So we measure this space, we call it the brain stem, brain stem hospital bond ratio, where we measure and compare this ratio. Because this ratio is normally inverted or becomes greater than one. If we divide this to 2.2 divided by 4.4. Eight, it should never be more than one, this ratio. If it is more than one, then we'll be suspecting that there is likely that there is likelihood that there is a major spina, uh, myelomeningocele or a spina bifida. And the baby will need to be scanned uh, through a transvaginal scan to look at the spine uh, carefully to rule out um, major myelomeningocele. Um, so that we call this, uh, this is the posterior fossa. Uh, this space is what is called the intracranial translucency, the fourth ventricle there. Then we also want to measure the BPD or bipartite diameter at this level, where we see the, uh, the correct plexus is with the midline, which you say the false cerebri. We get this image in first trimester. In second trimester, we will not get this kind of an image because the baby's uh, brain is developed. So this image is showing us the correct plexus is. These are the two correct plexus with the midline. This image is very important because this is the image that allows us to rule out holoprosencephaly and aloba holoprosencephaly and also anencephaly. Anencephaly and aloba holoprosencephaly are first trimester diagnoses, not second or third trimester diagnosis as is happening in our region. And of course, the spine also has to be checked. Then the kidneys have to be looked at. Um, it's, they are easier to see in coronal plane. As you can see, these are the baby's kidneys. I know they may be, you guys may find it difficult to appreciate them, but these are the kidneys with the renal pelvis which appear an earthquake there. And we always check the blood flow to these uh, kidneys to, uh, to just confirm that they are indeed present, especially in difficult scans. Then the extremities have to be checked to make sure that all the extremities are there. You don't want to tell a woman with focomelia where they are absent limbs that your baby is normal, yet the baby does not have the limbs uh, or the limbs. So you always have to confirm that the extremities are present. Now, having done that, the question now is, uh, if you do your nuchal translucency and you find that the nuchal translucency is actually increased as is seen in one of my images here. So if you find that the nuclear translucency is increased, this is the message that um, we always tell the women uh, we find with the nuclear translucency, which is above normal. Um, we say the nuclear translucency is normal or abnormal when you compare it to the CRL, not to the woman's gestational age or the pregnancy gestational age. We compare the nuclear to the crown ramp length of the baby. That is when you measure the baby from, uh, from the head to the, to the tip of the ramp, then we compare that to the nuclear translucency as I'll show you on the graphs. So a nuclear translucency is below the 95th center. Uh, what it simply means is that the risk of chromosome abnormalities is about 0.2%, which is okay because it will be probably below the population risk. So it will be about 0.2% because uh, the population risk of having Down syndrome is about one in 500 or so. But uh, so it will be below 0.2%, which is reassuring in normal nuclear translucency. So it does not necessarily rule out Down syndrome, we so want to say, but we are saying the likelihood becomes very little. Uh, and of course, these are the other risks. If the karyotype is normal, the risk of fetal deaths uh, are these ones. But I want to come to the abnormal ones to say if the nuclear translucency is between 95, 95 and 99 center, that is between uh, 3.5, uh, that is between uh, 95 and 99 center, which I'll show you on the nomogram. The risk of chromosome abnormality is about 4%, which is at 3.7% there. However, the risk that the, baby, the, the, the chance that the baby will be born alive and well is about 93%. And the risk of uh, major fetal defense is about, about 2.5%. Uh, what you have to notice is that the trend or the, the 
the likelihood of having the probability of having a chromosome abnormalities increases as the nuclear transmission becomes more and more abnormal. For example, a nuclear transmission of greater than 6.5 millimeters will mean that the risk of chromosome ab abnormality is about 64 to 64%. Uh, and the risk that the baby uh, will die in uterus is about 19%. And the risk that there will be a, a fetal defect is about 46%. And the, risk, and the chance that the baby will be born alive is about 15%. What message is this table telling us? What this message, what the, the, the table that this message is telling us is that if the nuclear transmission is abnormal, it is not just the chromosome abnormality that we have to worry about. We also have to worry about the presence of major fetal abnormalities. We have to worry about the risk of the baby dying inside the mother's uh, womb. This is the reason why a woman with abnormal nuclear transmission will need to be referred to a fetal medicine unit so that the baby can be evaluated on top of chromosome abnormalities for these other conditions. So even if the baby's chromosome uh, defect screening is normal, let's say we have done the amniocentesis and the result comes back as low risk. That does not mean that the baby is, is okay. The baby will still need to be ruled out uh, for major fetal abnormalities and also to be continuously be screened for the possible cause of indirectum fetal death, such as placenta insufficiency, uh, plus, uh, placenta insufficiency and fetal maternal hemorrhage. These are some of the leading causes of why babies die. So having seen that graph, the question is, if, if an NT is done, we have sent the woman, we are the practitioner, we have sent the woman to have an NT scan done. If the NT is done, in, in most of our regions, most doctors don't do their NT. They are done by sonographers. They are done by radiographers. So if it is done, the NT, what is it that you have to do as the practitioner? If the NT is done, you have sent the woman for NT, the NT is normal. That means it's below the 95th center. The woman will still need to be offered combined tests or a fetal cell free DNA test, depending on whether the woman can afford the fetal cell free DNA test to screen for aneuploidy. A normal nuclear translucency does not exclude Down syndrome and does not mean that you have screened the woman for Down syndrome. If the nuclear transmission is between the 95th and the 99th standard, the woman still needs to be offered combined tests or a self-free DNA test, depending on whether she can afford or not. If the risk is low from the combined or a fetal self-free DNA test, the nuclear fold will still need to be assessed at 16 weeks. If it is too persistent, this woman will need, woman will need to be offered touch screen and a fetal echo at 20 weeks because the, the incidence of uh, cardiac defects is increased in women with abnormal nuclear translucency. If the woman is a high risk after the, uh, 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 the, the combined test or the fetal self-reading test, then the woman will need to be offered amniocentesis, that is both the, chromos uh, the conventional karyotype and the chromosome array. That is the, um, uh, the um, uh, the co comparative genomic hybrid, uh, hybridization array where we look at the chromosomes at a higher resolution. Then if the nuclear transmission is above the 99th center, then the woman, in this case, it is worthy to just offer the woman a diagnostic test. Um, I know that in, in clinical practice, some people may prefer to offer self uh, um uh, first, but if the nuclear translucent, because of what we have said here, that uh, a nuclear translucent above these values, these are the risks involved here. Because of those risks, it is always prudent to offer a straight, a, a straight uh, diagnostic test, either CVS or amniocentesis, and request both the conventional karyotype and also chromosome array. If the CVS or amniocentesis is normal, then the the nuclear fold need to be reassessed in 16 weeks. Is still present, we need to exclude other causes like torch. Then uh, we need to do a torch screen. Um, and then a fetal echo should be done again at 20 weeks to exclude cardiac defects. And we should be aware that these are some of the causes of why babies have increased nuclear translucency. It's not just Down syndrome alone. 
uh, cardiac dysfunction can cause, his, cause it, venous congestion in the head and neck can cause it, then altered comp composition of the extracellular matrix can cause it, and also failure of the lymphatic drainage and fetal anemia and hypoproteinemia and fetal infection can cause it. So all these causes you need to be assessed on a baby who has an abnormal nuclear translucency, where you have done the screening for Down syndrome and the, and the diagnostic test, and the test come, test come back as normal. Then um, what about the major markers? We have sent the woman for screening for a scan, 11 to, uh, to 14 week scan, and somehow, somehow, you bump onto some of the, uh, these major markers. What does this do to the risk? So irrespective of the measurement of the nuclear translucency, if the baby has a holoprosencephaly, the risk for trisomy 13 becomes one in two, irrespective of the measurement of the nuclear translucency. The risk that this baby will have uh, trisomy 13 is one in two. If there is evidence of diaphragmatic hernia, then the risk becomes of trisomy 18 becomes one in four. Then if there is arterial ventricular septal defect at the level of the heart, then the risk becomes one in two. If there is exome valus, then the risk of trisomy 13 becomes one in four. The risk for, uh, risk for trisomy 18, which is Edwards syndrome, becomes one in four. The risk for uh, uh, Patau, which is trisomy 13, becomes one in 10. Uh, if there's mega cystis, that is a big bladder, which we mentioned that you have to do, the risk becomes one in 10. This therefore means that um, checking for major defects is very, very important because it alters the risk uh, calculation for Down syndrome. Irrespective of your measurement of the NUCA, this become the risk. That means cut, uh, uh, automatically the, the woman becomes a very high risk case that needs um, a diagnostic test. You don't have to proceed to do the, uh, uh, the combined or the fetal self test, but you might want to go straight for the diagnostic test that is um, an amniocentesis or a CVS, depending on the gestational age. Right. So. I, I just touched the nuclear translucency because I thought this was the most confusing uh, part for, for most uh, listeners the last time. But uh, let me just go through again the world screening program to say how does this screening program for, for Down syndrome work in real practice. Whenever we are screening women, of course, we, sh we should be aware that the screening performance is affected by racial origin. So that means the race has to be mentioned whenever you are screening the weight of the woman, the smoking history, the method of conception, and of course the machine and the reagents used for the analysis of the biochemical samples. And the combined test, which is the most common test done in our region in most parts of Europe and probably America, but most countries are now moving to fetal cell free DNA tests. So these tests will include the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the proteins, which is pregnancy associated plasma protein A, which is PAP A, and the free beta CG on top of the nuclear translucency and the maternal age. And it should be done between 11 weeks to 13 weeks and six days. And we interpret, in our setup, we interpret one in 100 as the low and high risk. But laboratories now report what is called an intermediate risk which is normally between one in 100 and one in 500, so that we decide which women to offer fetal cell free DNA tests. Then of course, the additional markers can also be added, which I've already told you, the nasal bone, ductus venosus, Doppler A wave, and the trachus regression can be added. And to put them all together, so this, this is the combined test, the simple form of the combined test without the additional markers. So in other words, we are saying we include the maternal age, then we include the nuclear translucency, then we include the puppy and the beta CG. Uh, one thing to understand with the nuclear translucency is that the nuclear translucency is compared with the CRL. As you can see, this is the nomogram, the distribution of the nuclear translucency after uh, many thousands of cases that were done by Fetal Medicine Foundation. When they plotted the uh, nuclear translucency, uh, of normal babies, this was sort of the distribution of our nuclear translucency distributed against crown ramblings. So this therefore means that 
the nuclear translucency nomogram increases with the CRL. It therefore follows that for a baby with 85 millimeters of crown ramp length, a nuclear translucency of about 2.5 may actually be within the 95th centile as compared to a baby with 45 millimeters, where a nuclear translucency of 2.5 is above the 95th centile. This therefore means that you cannot give an arbitrary value and tell a woman that your nuclear translucency is above two is 2.8, so it is normal because it is less than three. It is not correct. You have to plot the nuclear translucency on the crown ramp length nomogram for you to know whether the uh, nuclear translucency is within normal range or not. Most modern, modern machines will plot this for you on the nomogram. However, you also have to realize that the 99th sendal, the 99th sendal of the nuclear translucency is about 3.5 but some papers will, will report it at three millimeters. What is the 99th center? The 99th center is that value whereby we say if, if the measurement we have done, irrespective of the crown ramp length, it will be abnormal if it is above 3.5 millimeters. So th that is the 99th center. So I do agree, if you say a value above 3.5 millimeters is abnormal, I do agree to that. But you cannot say a, a value of above 2.5 millimeters is abnormal arbitrary without uh, comparing it to the CRL. Then when it comes to the uh, biochemical markers, when you look at the graph of the biochemical markers, we can see that for uploid fetuses, the multiples of median is one. What do we mean by multiples of median? We are saying if we look at babies who are normal and we compare them, to babies with Down syndrome, when we divide the, num the number of times that the measurement of babies with Down syndrome goes into the normal values or of the normal population, that is what you call the multiples of median. To say how many times does the value we have obtained from the nuclear translucency for the patient who are testing go into the population median. So the deviation of Papier for babies with Down syndrome is more marked when you do the papier when the baby is around 11 weeks um, compared to when you do it when the baby is towards 13 weeks. So that means papier, which is the other biochemical markers, performs way much better when it is done at 11 weeks compared to when it is done at 13 weeks. However, for BTCG, it is opposite. So this therefore means when you are screening for Down syndrome, we need to strike for a balance where we do the screening around 12 weeks so that we may benefit from the performance of these two markers. Um, the a priori risk. So whenever a pregnant woman walks into your room, when you ask the pregnant woman the age, just based on the age, the woman will have a risk for having a baby with Down syndrome. And these are the risks as shown there. And the risk changes the gestational age because some of the babies with chromosome or abnormalities die intrauterine or they are miscarried. As a result, the risk changes with the gestational age. So this therefore means the a priori risk is not the one that we have to use to tell the woman that your risk is one in, one in 70 because you are 40. If we do that, we'll be stuck in the 1970s, whereby they were screening 5% of the pregnancies because most women were getting pregnant, 5% of the pregnant women were getting pregnant after the age of 35, and they were only picking 30% of cases with Down syndrome. Although we know that the demography in developing countries have changed, so that 20% of uh, pregnancies are happening after the age of 35, and they are not picking 50% of the cases of the Down syndrome in women above the age of 35. So if you do use the maternal age alone as your basis for screening, you are going to be missing babies with Down syndrome. And you may apply an invasive test unnecessarily. Then what should we use? This is to show you how the other, the other abnormalities are performed, that is stress in 18 and 13. But I'll just jump this because it's self-explanatory. The same way I've said it before, I'll just jump this and go to 
Uh, this I've already explained it and this one I've explained it. But before I go there, uh, let me just illustrate some of the wrong measurements of NT. Uh, this is the wrong measurement of NT because the baby's flex at the neck. And this is a wrong measurement because the baby is extended at the neck. So you overestimate NT, you underestimate NT. This is wrong because the image is not well zoomed. The image should be zoomed to just show the thorax and the head. This is wrong again because it is oblique. We are seeing the zygoma bone. We don't measure the nuchal translucency on an oblique image. Um, I'll just skip this uh, part. I just want to go to, sorry. Sorry, right. Just a second, just a second. I want to go back to my slide slide here to, to explain a little bit uh, uh, further on them. So the, the message with this uh, uh, slide is to say, do not use the maternal age alone. You have to combine it, maternal age, nuclear translucency, and either um, the biochemical markers or and the additional ultrasound scan markers. This I've already explained how it behaves. Nuclear translucency behaves with the CRL and also to explain that nuclear translucency performs better between 11 to 12 weeks than it does at uh, 13, to 13 weeks in screening for Down syndrome. So the best time to do this screening is either between 11 and 12 weeks, 11 to 12 weeks, because it performs better the test because you can easily distinguish these babies if you measure at 11 to 12 weeks than if you measure at 13 to 12, 13 to 14 weeks there. This has been explained well, and this one. Um, this, uh, to just show you the distribution of babies with Down syndrome, that babies with Down syndrome are more likely to measure abnormal. Uh, however, there will still be babies with Down syndrome who will have a normal nuclear translucency. This is the reason why we, we are saying you cannot tell a woman that your baby is no Down syndrome because the nuclear translucency is normal, because they could have normal, abnormal biochemical markers, because babies with Down syndrome can also measure normal. These graphs are explaining the same uh, picture, but what we are saying is that if the nuclear is abnormal, the likelihood ratio of having a Down syndrome increases. Then to do the nuclear translucency, we should always know that the Fetal Medicine Foundation offers training globally and certifies people who do nuclear translucency. If you want to do nuclear translucency in the right way, subject your work to, uh, uh, to, to audit uh, by Fetal Medicine Foundation and you, you can be certified and be given a certificate that you are doing it properly uh, because there are consequences of doing nuclear translucency if you are not properly trained and certified. And it is all on the website. And people who are certified to do nuclear translucency are also found on the Fetal Medicine Foundation website for each country. So I want to encourage all performers of ultrasound scan here that please seek certification with the, uh, the Fetal Medicine Foundation. As the Fetal Medicine Unit in Zimbabwe, we offer training on how to do nuclear translucency properly so that you can be certified. Um, this is just to show you how the, the quality assurance work. Uh, you can do quality assurance on your own by checking how your nuclear translucents are distributed. This is the normal distribution you see there. And this is when you are underestimating the nuclear translucency. You see that if you do your 100 nuclear translucency and you plot them on the graph, they will all fall below there. Uh, below, most of them will be distributed below the normal limit there. Then if you are overestimating, this is how your fig figures will be distributed. This is a soft audit you can also do on your own. Then the PAPI and the BTSCG, I've already explained these uh, hormones, how they uh, work in terms of the Down syndrome. And uh, we also have to know that they increase uh, for PAPI, it increases the gestational age. For BTSCG, it drops the gestational age. But for babies with Down syndrome, uh, PAPI decreases. Uh, for babies with Down syndrome, and it, and it is also decreased in the following condition that includes Edwards, Patau, triploidy, fetal growth restriction, pre eclampsia, and preterm birth. Then, as for the BTSCG, it actually um, uh, peaks around 12 weeks and drops uh, towards pregnancy. But in babies with Down syndrome, it increases so that it uh, reaches two, two multiples of median. 
but it is reduced in babies Edwards and Patau syndrome, and also in babies fetal growth restriction in preeclampsia. Uh, this is our local experience. Uh, we subjected our results to, to audit uh, where we submitted the, uh, the results of our patients uh, the, uh, on the FMF website and we were assessed and we passed the audit and this was our detection rate using nuclear translucents alone and also biochemical markers. We are not doing that bad in terms of our performance. Then in terms of uh, our own experience in terms of whether women are being screened, uh, we, we, we did an audit of the patients who were coming to us in fetal medicine unit in second trimester and we noted that most practitioners are actually not offering screening for Down syndrome alone. Probably this is reflected in most parts uh, of the, this region. 53% uh, of the women would tell her that they were never offered by their practitioner. And um, only 18% were offered combined tests. The other 9% were offered NIPT. And 16% of the women declined any form of test. This is still a very common problem in our region. And of course, uh, we, we did it during the lockdown period. So some could indeed, because the lockdown had locked down our laboratory. Currently in our country, we, ex we send our sample to South Africa. So they were locked down. The NIPT, I've already described it, is a fit or self DNA test, which use these three methods to analyze uh, the fetal cells in the, inside the, uh, the, uh, the mother's blood. There is some fragments of the baby's DNA in the mother's blood, which is extracted through these chemical processes, and it is analyzed to uh, estimate the risk. This I'll leave it for another day because it's a very big topic. Uh, then in terms of screening, uh, I want you, you again to know that the Fetal Medicine Foundation offers license to, to people who have passed the audit and also the, uh, uh, the certification. You will be given a license that allows you to, to calculate the risk for Down syndrome of your patients um, using any of these um, parameters. So this software is available at the FMF website to people who have been certified the FMF that they can do nuclear translucency and you can calculate your own risk. Uh, to just show you a result interpretation for one of our patients there. So this is just to show you that this is the background risk. This is after adjusting the risk, after putting uh, in all the markers and uh, this is what we are getting. Uh, the software allows us to calculate the risk for preeclampsia which is the talk for tomorrow, uh, where we screen for preeclampsia as well in first trimester, but I will not dwell in this, but this is for Down syndrome, Edwards, and Patel. So this therefore means that you can calculate for the risk for Down syndrome using these parameters. Uh, and also you can include the biochemistry. Once the labor is done, the biochemistry, you can calculate your own risk using the biochemical markers from the lab. Um, I'm, I'm just rushing because my time is up today is starting a little bit. Um, then I want to discuss a subject which is a little bit gray, uh, probably in most area. It's called second trimester risk recalculation. Um, what is this risk recalculation? So we are seeing a woman who has done a, a risk in first trimester and they've done a combined test and they've been told that their baby's risk of Down syndrome is one in 16,517. But when this woman came for the second trimester anomaly scan, we noted that the uh, another bone was absent or hypoplastic. So we are going to take a one day and this formula is an Excel formula. So it's going to recalculate the risk uh, of Down syndrome to see if the woman falls into the high risk category or not. If the woman is still in the low risk category, we reassure the woman that, look, it's highly unlikely that your baby will have Down syndrome and you don't need to do anything to this woman. However, if we noted that for the nasal bone, then there's also increase in knuckle fold. This will change. How do we come up with this combined likelihood ratio? So what we do is we, we, add, we, 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 we calculate all the, uh, the, the positives here, including these negative ones, which are not there then we'll come up with this likelihood ratio. So you can see for this patient, this will change a risk to high risk. The same applies here. If all these markers are, the risk will change. And also here, the risk will change. And at the end of the day, the woman will fall into a high risk category and do offer a combined test. 
we offer a, a diagnostic test, sorry. Then in terms of result handling, if you do the combined test or the down, uh, the the of DNA test and the re result is low risk, we just reassure the woman do nothing. But if the risk is high, there are three options. The woman can choose to do nothing as long as she un is understood the risk. Then the fetal self test can also be offered instead of an, an invasive test. If the risk is high, then we offer the, the invasive test, coronic villa assembly for before 15 weeks and the amniocentesis for after. Then this is our recommendation that all women should be offered screen for annual pre-D and preferably the combined test. And uh, ultrasound scan should always be done, even if a woman is offered self DNA test. The uh, self DNA test is not, is not going to tell you that there's anencephaly, it's not going to tell you that there's holoprosencephaly, neither is it going to tell you that there's omphalose. As a result, the ultrasound scan should always be done, even if you are doing fetal self DNA test. Then I think we are done. Uh, thanks to this wonderful team. Uh, uh, this was in Alicante with Professor Nicolai de Zane, Spain last year, uh, with the wonderful team who worked with us in, for, uh, in, in the fetal engine units. In a case where we don't have the facilities of fetal medicine, where you can do amniocentesis and all those kind of invasive testing, what is the role, what is the medical legal issues of now screening? And if you can't, or you don't have facilities, easily available to, because this is a screening. So if you don't have uh, facilities to now do the testing, uh, what, what do you think about it and how do you go about it? Um, the modern healthcare requires that uh, every woman should be given what you call a reproductive choice. And also modern healthcare is moved to what you call individualized care. Um, I know that most public health systems, at the moment, what we have done is we have made everyone the same, we've bind everyone in a group, and we've defined them and we've decided for them that this is the level of care they require. But I'm of the school of thought that uh, every woman, the way we practice in the fetal medicine is that every woman, irrespective of where they are coming from, we tell them the correct information to tell them that, look, we can screen you for Down syndrome if you want. But however, we may have limitations in doing A, B, C, D, which upon if the result happens to be high risk, we might need to refer you. In our case, we don't refer, but when, when you don't have, don't have the facilities, you may tell the woman that we might need to refer you to a sender that can do more tests. You may ask, why do we, do we have to do that? Because if you don't screen, the calamity which is happening in our region is that most women are not being screened. But you see them coming with a holoprosencephaly baby 35 weeks. And we have to do it if a termination at 35 weeks. You see women coming with uh, cystic hygromas at 25 weeks or 30 weeks with cystic hygroma, and they've never been offered any form of training, uh, of screening. So personally, I do not think we, we are doing these women a favor. A woman may say, look, doc, uh, I want to do this test probably do it, or the woman may say, Doc, I didn't want to do it. I've understood it, but I don't want to do it, probably because I don't want to travel to another city if the results come back. But there are some women who choose to have them, which I'm saying they should be given the individual reproductive choice to make a decision for their pregnancy. F fully understood. So, in, uh, I'm just going to have a follow up on that, you know, the, with the challenges of referring from province to another province uh, mm -hmm. in our institution, even with patients with cancer, right? Mm -hmm. And um, this is just a background with us. Uh, even mm -hmm. a patient who needs to be operated by the gynae oncologist, uh, mm -hmm. you will be told that, okay, uh, from province to province, the challenges of, of referring um, it's, it's very high. And what is the danger of screening? And because the thing is, we need to identify that screening is not confirmation of an abnormalities. You're so right. even if the screening is high, it's showing high risk, it doesn't mm -hmm. mean that patient has, uh, you know, you still have to now confirm it. You're so right. so uh, what, is, what is your take? Because for, for 
us, it means that um, when we do that, we're going to be sending patients to another province. Um, for, and, and don't get me wrong, this should be done. We should send them to the, to the province. So, but what I'm getting at is that what you are doing, your work of teaching us from Zimbabwe and teaching the whole of Lumpur, with teaching of the whole of people in Southern Africa. You are expanding and conscientizing us on this, you know, because if we are now concentrating on CSA, because of ovarian cancer, and, and we think this is a lesser of a problem, it is a big problem. And the only thing we, we don't think is a problem is because we are not doing those tests. So in a form of encouragement of, uh, what would you say about, about that, uh, where those resources you have to go through a lot of hoops to jump through to be able to give the patient the, the services which you are easily can can able to give in your in your in your, in your um, unit. Um, Dr. Dakalo, you are right that there are challenges which we have in our region um, in in the fact that um, we may not have the right uh, supporting services to offer screening for Downs. But my, my, my job as a fetal medicine specialist is to advocate for the fetal patient, which I feel that um, a lot of strides has been made in adult medicine, such as screening for cervical cancer, right? A screening for many other conditions. But I always feel that the fetus as a patient has been sort of neglected uh, in our region, such that uh, even the death of a baby is not the biggest story in most hospitals, so that there are no big papers that are written. But the message is that we need to advocate for our governments to, do, to offer the women the right kind of service. Because being in a certain geographical place should not disadvantage you to this level, whereby we, our women, we are diagnosing them at 35 weeks. This is what is happening. Where our women are being told that your baby is going to have Down syndrome, or they are told at birth that you are carrying a baby with Down syndrome. So I think this can be done, but there will be need, there will be a lot of um, advocacy that will be required at the level of the government. Then on your part, uh, Dr. Abdakalo, I think Limpopo needs to send uh, someone to be trained in fetal medicine. Limpopo is too big a province now. You need a fetal medicine services. So you need to send uh, people for training Limpopo. <laughs> Just like Zimbabwe, we, we are training because we, are, we have realized that fetal medicine service is essential to provide complete uh, package of health care to, to the women in our region. No, I, I fully agree. Thank you so much. We have already sent uh, one who is busy now in, with the training. And the good news is that every second week he comes back and he's learning. And it's going to take him four years to come back but we have already sent someone. So um, I think Limpopo is pushing towards that and thanks to your conscientization. Um, the other question is uh, a sonographer, what are the eligibility criteria for a sonographer to do the NT scan? Um, the, the NT scan, great. So the NT scan, who are the health cadres who can scan? The NT scan can be done by uh, health workers who are trained. Let's start probably at the level of the sonographer, the midwife, the obstetrician and gynecologist. They can all do the anti scan. But doing an anti scan requires a rigorous training. And of course, it will require certification by FMF. Uh, in most countries which are doing this anti scan, these anti uh, scans are done by the cadres that I've mentioned from midwives radiographers, obstetrician and gynecologists, and of course, fetal medicine specialists. But fetal medicine specialists, is not their job to actually be doing all the anti-scans. Their job is to manage those who are identified during the anti-scans that they are abnormal. But anti-scans can be done by all these cadres after they've been adequately trained and certified by FMF. It is possible. I worked in centers where I was partly trained by midwives, I also worked in centers where I was partly trained by sonographers. And of course, I worked with fetal medicine specialists who trained me and my fellow um, uh, fellows who also trained me. So all these cadres can be trained to be competent in doing fetal um, and doing uh, NUCA translucency. Lovely. We've got Julia from 
Uh, Botswana. Julia, your comment, please. And uh, your comment, please, Julia. Um, hello, everyone. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Dakalo, my internet had cut me off. So um, I attended only half of the presentation, but otherwise, always a good job, Dr. Verenga. We are happy to hear from you every single week. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you so much. Even my internet today is really in between. It's, it has been cutting. I don't know what's happening today. In, in Limpopo, we'll call it Kibuloi. I don't know in Zimbabwe if you have something like that. <laughs> OK, I've got Lubna Fredericks on the line. Lubna is saying, from your experience, uh, Dr. Verenga, in fetal ultrasound screening, what is the minimum ultrasound specification yeah, yeah, you recommend for this work? Ah, th that's a very good question. Of course, doing nuclear translucent properly will, will require, uh, let's start with probably a mid range, a mid range ultrasound, um, a mid range to top range ultrasound. So uh, we should have an ultrasound scan that allows you to zoom. Well, zooming is very important because you won't see the images we are seeing without the ability to zoom. And the ultrasound scan should also have a very good resolution because without a good resolution, you won't see the nuclear uh, fluid. But in most mid-range, more than mid-range machines can do nuclear translucent scan. But the, the best machines we have, uh, for, for a fetal medicine need, of course, you need the top range because that's the diagnostic level. But for screening, a mid-range machine is good enough. But the uh, entry-level machines, most entry-level machines are not good enough. The entry machines, you know, those small box, uh, which in, in most cases, they may not have color or they may have color, but they are very small box. The entry-level, very cheap machines, you will have challenges in a, doing a new code translucency uh, scan with those kind of machines. But if you want the actual specification in terms of the actual numbers, is something that you can share if you just conduct us on the FM, FM, FMF Zim uh, uh, um, email there. We can uh, help you with the uh, exact specifications and also the brands that we, uh, we highly recommend for this. Yes, I must encourage uh, people that you must join the annual conference, the ZASOC. Uh, these team of, of experts in Zimbabwe and Zasok, they know how to organize event. I was invited in one. I had a good time of my life that side. I, in the process of uh, presenting there, I also learned a lot through, through the team. And of course, our very own Professor Lynette Denny, who is yeah. a head of department in UCT will be there. So please guys, um, join tomorrow uh, and I will also be joining. I really can't wait. And then we have a quick uh, comment from Mopati Precious. She's saying, Dr. Varenga, thank you so much. Great presentation. We really appreciate you, you giving us your time. Uh, Dr. You. Varenga, another question here. Um, in what is the current incidence of fetal aneuploidy in assistant conception? when you're doing IVF, for example? Uh, to be honest, I'll be honest, I don't have the figure from my head um, for, for that. I don't have, but what we know generally is that Down syndrome, depending on the population, is, is from one in 300 to one in 500, depending on the population, the Down syndrome incidence. But in our, um, in our setup, especially in the African region, eh, because we're not testing enough we don't really know how common these conditions are uh, because we're not testing enough in our region. But what our, from our own experience in the vitamin medicine unit, uh, the reason why we, we advocate that it be offered is because of the late diagnosis that we come across for most women uh, who are diagnosed very late. Some are even diagnosed at birth. And their story is, is heart-wrenching when they describe the pre their experience of being told that you have a baby with Down syndrome uh, uh, after delivery. Yeah, 
you, you can see from the questions that you are preaching to the right group, uh, Dr. Varen. And I tell you, we had around 70 uh, people listening to you. And today is Friday, Dr. Varenga. People want to go out, and but they didn't. They want to come and listen to, the, to you, which means uh, really, really, we are thankful for your time. This is another question. They're saying, can we please have a session on aneuploid screening on multiple pregnancies. You can see these are people who are doing these scans and they need to just expand on what they are doing already. You see, so that is a question from Sofin Kwena. Dr. Varenga? Yeah, fair enough, fair enough, we will prepare it. Marvelous. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the other question is that, this is coming from um, Katarisa from Cape Town. Uh, he's saying, after diagnosing Down syndrome, how do we orientate uh, the counseling for couples for possible medical termination of pregnancy? In my country where the government's policy about TOP are not clear, this country is saying is RD, RCD, which is Republic uh, RCD. Help me, Dr. Varenga, where is RCD? RCD. Dr. Katarisa, uh, please. Should be, it, should, it should be Democratic Republic of Congo, but written, it's spelled in French, Republic de uh, Democratic Congo, I think. Oh, yeah. I yeah. see. Hey, yeah. Katarisa, yeah. why are you telling us with your, uh. you, with your country of origin? But uh, Katarisa is one of the person who is attending from Wednesday and Friday, every single, every single, like twice a week, all the sessions, and we're going almost to 10 sessions, Katarisa is being supporting and, and, and learning with us. Um, thank you so much there in Cape Town. How is Cape Town weather there? <laughs> yes, um, can you answer the, uh, Katarisa's question, Doc? Um, of, of course, I think the legal, it is up to us, the health workers, the people who experience these challenges with women with Downs, to advocate for, for the legal instruments to allow women to make the reproductive choices. Um, it is only doctors who can uh, make the government aware that there is a condition called Down syndrome, which causes physical and mental handicap. And there's another one called um, Patau and another one called Edwards, where the baby is severely deformed in a way which is incompatible with life. So it is up to us to make the government and the politicians aware. Uh, in terms of the counseling, the message that we tell women with Down syndrome is that uh, Down syndrome, unfortunately, um, is associated with phys uh, uh, severe physical and mental handicap. And we always tell the women that you should not expect that your baby may live an independent life if they've got Down syndrome. Um, whether the, the woman wants a baby with Down syndrome does not want, it is the decision that the couple makes after we have explained to them the consequence of the giving birth to a baby with Downs. So the decision to terminate rests with the couple. How, why do we have to tell them? In a, in a situation where termination is not, required, is not uh, legalized, sometimes we tell the couple so that they can prepare themselves for the eventuality. Because nursing a baby with Down syndrome will require a lot of nursing care and the resources on the part of the couple. So the couple need to prepare in advance uh, if they are living in the developing world where they need to look for a carer, then, it, then they need to sa save some money so that they can hire a carer who will look after their baby if they are a professional couple. So these are, these, these are some of the reasons why women have to know what they are carrying um, in advance because we are living in 2020 where women have to, uh, have to be empowered in terms of knowing that the baby they are carrying indeed is, is, indeed is normal or there are some problems that we need to care after birth, and they need to know that in advance, not at birth. Yes, we can't wait for tomorrow for Professor Kapros Nikolaidi. Um, Yane, we are so excited about that. Uh, Johnson Katerisa is saying it's actually DRC. I think he spelled it in French, that's why. <laughs> so he's saying his country of origin is DRC. Dr. Verenga, I think we're running out of time. We still have questions people asking, um, but we can cover them at the next sessions. Uh, I just want to encourage you, Dr. Verenga, and encourage everyone to come and join and we do this because uh, this is a specialty which we don't have in most part of Africa and most part of our of 
of, of Limpopo and Dr. Verenga's time, we really appreciate it. Before we go, uh, there's a question from Dr. Petras Madula. Dr. Mwaba, since the beginning of the session, ultrasound section, I, I realized that even medical officers in district hospital can make vast change in fetal medicine. Can we be offered more detailed training in obstetric ultrasound? Okay, <laughs> you, Dr. Varenga, do you understand what I'm trying to say? That uh, as much as compared to our Wednesday, the people who are coming here are those who are doing the scans. They are those who are, are interested in that. What do you think about Dr. Madula's question? He's saying, uh, we have seen a lot of difference. I'll give you an example, Dr. Varenga. We get calls from a medical officer who will say, and he's calling me from a peripheral hospital, and they say that he did a scan, he's not sure what he sees, he's waiting for his senior uh, 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 person to come and verify the ultrasound. Nowadays, I get very le less of those kind of questions. Uh, more now, I'm getting pictures that I've got this, I think it's a, it's a, um, a mono pregnancy, I got this, I think it's a ectopic pregnancy. So people are now more uh, confident to just do the scan now, not waiting for the consultant or not waiting for the senior person to be there. So your effort, Dr. Berenga, is much appreciated and we can see from the ground the impact of it. Thank you, Dr. Adakalo. I think the experience is shared uh, with uh, what is happening in our country as well. Uh, we, we trained uh, staff from our district hospital uh, all throughout the country and they are always posting questions on the social media page we created with images and so forth. So indeed, there is overwhelming enthusiasm from the health workers um, uh, throughout who are um, participating in ultrasound. So uh, to the doctor who said, can they be trained more? You should be aware that ultrasound is the modern day stethoscope. How far you can use it, depending on your interest, how much you want to learn and be certified in doing what you do. Because it's a modern day stethoscope, there are no limitations to what you can do with the ultrasound in modern day medicine. So it's how much you want to spend uh, manipulating the probe and learning and improving yourself. Absolutely. Dr. Njungana is saying, how long is the nuclear uh, uh, anti-scan certification? How long, how long uh, is the process usually? Um, Unfortunately, it is a steep learning curve. Um, if, you, if you scan patients uh, regularly, you may need probably six months to, to be competent enough to be uh, certified. The learning curve is a little bit on the steep side because the baby is small. So uh, the manipulation of the probe and the, and the nobology is a little bit challenging for trainers, for, for trainees. So yeah, but it can be done. It can be done six months let me say is the average time one would take to be competent enough to be certified by Fetal Medicine Foundation. Marvelous. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. And thank you for your time. And thank you for expanding it from four o'clock up until now, half past. And people are still waiting to hear more. Dr. Verenga, I cannot thank you enough, my friend. Um, you have been so wonderful and a good gift for Southern Africa. And we were looking forward for next week as well. And then for my, the rest of the team on Wednesday, we are having another ESMO and please join in numbers. We are excited to have you all the time and your intriguing questions. Dr. Berenga, your last words, please. Um, th thank you everyone for taking your time to, understand, to attend. Um, I think the stage where we are here in Africa is to advocate for women to be offered screening for uh, annual ploidy. So those who are in leadership positions in your region, please advocate so that governments can fund screening for women. Then for the practitioners who are in private, give the, your patients what you call a reproductive choice. Please do not deny them. Tell them that the screening for Downs was, it's not fair for a woman who is being looked after in private to be told that you have holoprosencephaly uh, at 28 weeks. So offer them this reproductive choice, let them be screened for annual so that you are look after a pregnancy which has been done, managed in the correct way. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. With that, I say bye-bye. See you next week. Bye-bye.